Great. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to put a timer on, but if I start running, <laughs> if I start running over, please tell me. So I was wondering, you know, I've been here at MIT a few times. I met Jim. Hi, Jim. A few times I've given talks, and every time it was about my own work, and I was super proud that I was kind of like, my, my ego was boosted by talking about how the great stuff we had done. And, um, and, uh, and I'm just thinking, why, why is it that today, oh, I should start the presentation, I'm talking about something where I'm like author number 14 out of 70, and, um, and why am I so proud of it? And, and, and to explain it, I, I need to uh, explain to you how I got to this point. And the way I got to this point is by experiencing something that I think many of you might have experienced, which is like, I would read a great article on parietal cortex in the mouse. I work on mouse decision making and vision and stuff. And I would say, great, okay, so this article says that the parietal cortex of the mouse does blah. And then I would read another article that says that it does something else. And then I would produce an article that says that it does yet another thing. And then I would wonder, maybe we're all wrong, maybe we're all right, but who knows where they put their electrodes? And this was done in different countries, fine, which actually means different mouse strains, but that's a different story. Um, different, uh, you know, in the different tasks, certainly different mice, different neurons, therefore. Um, and there's no way, and different analyses on these data. Um, so there's no way to know. Maybe we're all c correct. Maybe we're all wrong. Maybe we're talking about different parts of the brain. And so this is a problem that is pervasive in, in, in neuroscience. And, 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 and this is my motivation for why I'm here today. Um, compounding this problem is the fact that there is a crisis of reproducibility, or at least there's been a lot of talk of a crisis of reproducibility in neuroscience. So here are some titles, um, just copy and pasted, of articles that uh, should give you the heebie-jeebies about reproducibility, okay? <laughs> like, for example, if you expose a mouse to the smell of men, uh, that's it. You know, the, the, the behavior will be completely different. Even a t-shirt of a guy in the room would change the behavior. Um, and, and actually, all of these titles on the left, you don't need to read them all, all the ones on the left side are all about rodent behavior and how hard it is to reproduce it, okay? And then the two articles on the right, I think they're really interesting. Well, they're all interesting, but they're about how small sample size uh, really undermines what we do. Um, and apparently, pharmaceutical companies have a history of reading nature papers by neuroscientists, then going into the lab at scale um, and trying to reproduce and failing. And in fact, pretty much all pharmaceutical companies have closed their neuroscience efforts, and I wonder if that's related. But anyway, and then in the last article is, to me, fascinating. A bunch of very good labs are, were given all the same fMRI data to work with, and they came up with very, very, very different answers. And I actually, I want you to keep that in mind because it's going to be a little relevant also to what we're going to talk about now. So I think we're going to, in this talk, we're going to overcome all of these problems, but potentially we will still have the last one. And I think that's endemic to neuroscience. Um, I'm going to share the slides, so I'm happy to, if there is a way to share the slides. There will be a way to share the slides. Um, okay, so, so what we did is a new model for collaboration in neuroscience. Um, uh, so we didn't want to shut down our labs and all move to Seattle, be, though <laughs> well, we love Seattle, but I don't think they would have taken us, right? And so, and so we had to find another way, and we were in different countries in different places. So we formed a virtual laboratory. Some, think, think, some people think it's enormous, 22 labs, it's a ton of people. In fact, it's just a couple of postdocs in each lab. So the scale is kind of, Nothing compared to you know Jim's lab at MIT, um, and uh, and uh, no Jim has a small lab I bet. But anyway, some labs here have 50 people. So all in all, if you're really inclusive, there's about 70 researchers and 10 central staff. And our, our, our mantras were standardization, data pooling among us, and also dissemination of our data and of our tools, hugely inspired by the Allen Institute. And our mission was to understand brain-wide circuits during a simple complex behavior. Specifically, we wondered, you know, how does a complex behavior emerge from hundreds of brain areas processing information related to sensation, decisions, actions, and prior beliefs? So, uh, by the way, this was around 2017, Neuropixels pros were starting to come out, and, 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 and so we wanted to exploit that to get a brain-wide view of the brain. So the task that we developed is a task that is very simple. It's based on a mouse turning a wheel, um, and, and it's actually the opposite movement that, than the one you would make if you're driving. Um, and it turns out that it's very simple for the mouse to do because if there's a visual stimulus on the right, uh, mice, imagine, imagine I'm a mouse and I want to orient towards Jim. Jim, Jim to, I'm talking about you a lot today, I don't know why. Uh, I want to orient towards him, I'm gonna go like this because mice don't move their eyes but rather they move their whole, 
And so in doing this, my arms have gone left, and Jim has gone, last time I mentioned you, has gone in the center of my view. This is what we're asking our mice to do. It's a totally trivial form of virtual reality. There is actually a visual stimulus that will move to the left when the mouse turns the wheel. Uh, and we have this, this is just a little bit of a standardized piece of equipment that we ship to 11 experimental labs, and then we have 11 theoretical labs. And so this up to now is a pure, oh, by the way, the mouse gets a drop of water when it moves this thing to the center. Up to now, this is a purely visual task, um, but we have a twist on it, which is that the probability of stimuli appearing on the right or on the left changes over time. So it starts at 50-50, um, and then at some point, uh, unknown to the mouse, it s switches to 80-20 or 20-80, okay? And, and in gray here, you have what the stimuli are doing on average. I can't see my mouse. Um, just a second, I'm gonna get a better pointer. Uh, I could also put my, my pointer options, yeah. Okay, so, and, in, and you can see that the mouse in general follows its, its, with its decisions, the statistics. Now, how would you do this task? Basically, if the stimulus has high contrast, you should just go with the stimulus, right? Because that's what's gonna get you a reward. But if the stimulus has low contrast, you, you're not really sure of it, you might as well go with your prior. Your experience has been that the stimulus was very likely to be on the left for the last 30 trials, for example, so you should go with your prior. So at zero contrast, you should be totally driven by the past experience. At high contrast, you should be totally driven by vision. This is what our mice do. So ignore the middle line, that's the 50-50 case. Uh, the red line is the 20-80 case. The blue line is the 80-20 case. On the uh, x-axis, you have the amount of contrast that was on the left side or on the right side. Uh, on the y-axis is the proportion of times the animal chose the, the right size, the one on the right. And, 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 and we were able, this is just summarizing a whole paper, uh, to obtain the same results in, in uh, about seven labs around the world. Uh, and then the others came online later. So, uh, so the, with this work, we were able to, oh, by the way, um, at zero contrast, when there's nothing on the screen, the mouse is uh, very much driven by past experience, right? And at high contrast instead, 100%, it's essentially completely driven by vision. Okay, so now we have a task. It's, we've, we've achieved the replication, so we can ignore all those papers I've shown you on the left, but we still have all those other problems. So the next problem was um, to share data across a wide community, and in retrospect, I wish I'd spent more time making this slide. This is the one straight out of the paper, but roughly speaking, this is the stuff that happens within a lab like mine, and everything that happens out here um, happens um, uh, in, in various places around the world, and we use some of the tools you just heard about, data join, near data without borders. And um, now that we have this pipeline and, and we use it, and we also have rules that data need to be shared a certain number of months after acquisition, whether you have analyzed it or not, and so on. Um, then we have a whole pipeline that runs on this uh, centralized database um, uh, in which we are able to extract all sorts of behavioral measurements, such as the reaction time of the mouse. And I just actually want to keep uh, I would like you to keep this somewhere in your brain for the, after the visual stimulus comes up, by the way, there's a go queue at the time of the visual stimulus, um, um, which, could, by the way, the visual stimulus could be not there, right, at zero contrast, but the go queue will always be there. Then the reaction of the mouse will be within usually a couple hundred milliseconds. This is gonna be useful to know in a slide or two. And while this is all happening, we are tracking all sorts of aspects of the behavior using deep lab cut or other code that we have uh, uh, developed in, in, in IBL. Uh, I think this is all done with deep lab cuts. So we will know um, what the paws are doing, what the tongue is doing, what the eyes are doing, and so on. Whether, whether the animal is whisking, and so on. So, um, uh, this was supposed to play, which um, it's not. Um, so what if I don't want a pointer? Let's see. Uh, I don't know how to do this. Oh, I hear it. Um, it's not playing. Is it playing for you? It's not playing here. Oh, that's annoying. Okay, it's not happy. It's not playing. Anyway, it would be, uh, there would be here on the left side, there would be a mouse uh, doing the task, although it's a, 
actually a reconstruction of the mouse doing the task. And on the right, you would see a million dots of light, like uh, the earlier Bush used to say, uh, which would be all these neurons uh, firing um, as the task is happening. But um, the conceptually, what you're seeing is here. We have all these measurements here, just three of them, uh, whether the animal, well, four, whether the animal made a right choice or a left choice, uh, whether what the wheel velocity is, what the whisking is, what the licking is. And down here, we would have the one recording from one neuropixels probe. This animation would have shown it for um, you know, the whole brain. So the first thing we had to worry about was whether our own data was reproducible. Okay? And so what we imposed was a pretty draconian condition, which is that every mouse that goes through our uh, setup needs to be recorded all in the same place. Okay, which is a place that goes through uh, these regions that you see here. The cortex is the, cortex is the blue one at the top, the uh, hippocampus and, uh, and some thalamus. And everybody was, you see all these lines? These were all supposed to be a single line. So uh, everybody was told exactly where to put the electrode. And that already gives you a sense of variability, right? Because we know where the electrodes went because we did the reconstruction. So even if you're reading papers from people who did their best to put their electrodes in the same place, that's what you get, okay? And this is the best effort. You can only imagine when you read a paper that says, I put my electrodes in parietal cortex, what the distribution <laughs> would be, okay? So I'm gonna skip this paper, um, but, the, but it's all about the reproducibility within our data. So now, uh, in, in, in the various uh, mice that would be in the various labs, Every mouse needs to be recorded in this site, which is called the repeated site, but then every mouse will be also recorded in many other places, okay? And, uh, and, and our coverage um, is shown here. Uh, here. Here is the list of authors of this paper. I'm somewhere here. Yeah, I'm, you know, uh, usually I don't talk about stuff in which I'm the sixth author. But anyway, um, and, uh, uh, but this is what you get if you're trying to go something at scale. So we will have 547 insertions in 115 mice. Uh, overall, we recorded from about 300,000 neurons. We applied a very stringent test to quality, so I'm gonna tell you today about 32,000 neurons. Um, but one could use different spike sorting algorithms and come up most likely with more neurons. Um, and so now the next question is how to visualize what we're going to do. The brain is uh, pesky because it's three-dimensional. Um, and, and, and so what we've discovered in the process of doing this work is that we prefer to use this kind of representation here on the right, uh, uh, which is three-dimensional, and I hope to show it to you in, in a website when I'm done with the talk. Uh, but for the purposes of publishing a paper, you need something two-dimensional. And so we adopted Larry Swanson's flat map, which is pretty great. Um, it, it is a whole brain squished so that it looks like a zebrafish. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, but, but it is actually done with a really interesting scaling. It's got every single region of the Allen CCF on it. Uh, and we, uh, we developed a mapping from the Allen CCF to this. Um, the only problem with it is that we have zero intuition about it. So, so, so like, if I show you this and you've seen enough mouse brains, you will know what I'm talking about. But if I say, oh, look, this is happening here, you'll be like, and what is that? So that is a bit of an issue, but I'm gonna stick to the flat map because for a short talk, um, it, it's the only thing we get. So first of all, um, where are our neurons? They are uh, blissfully in all brain regions. Um, and so this is a log scale, by the way. So, so, um, it, so that it is actually displaying quite a bit of a difference in, uh, in yield. Um, but it's not adjusted by brain size, by region size. Some regions are positively enormous, like the caudate putamen, and others are tiny. And um, now you can, this is the only time when you will see a graph like this, is I'm showing you the average activity of all the neurons in each region aligned to the onset of the stimulus. And so you can start to wonder who responds first when the visual stimulus comes up. This would be a contralateral stimulus. Oh, by the way, I should tell you, all of our recordings are in one hemisphere uh, for, the, for, for the brain, and or, well, for the, what's, what's the brain minus cerebellum? Uh, for brain? No. I guess, anyway, brain minus cerebellum, and for the cerebellum, it's the opposite hemisphere, right? Because uh, that's how they roll. Okay, um, which I actually, to be honest, didn't know before this. Um, and, um, and, so, and so then we can ask, where do we start to see responses earliest? This is a map of latencies. And for all of these maps, I will always be showing you the five regions where we have uh, the most uh, interesting data, okay? The, the, the strongest data, in this case, the shortest latency. So LGN, lateral genicular nucleus, uh, uh, luckily uh, makes sense, would respond first to visual stimuli and so on. And others, this is Vizel is a visual area, RSP, retrospinal, and so on. Okay, so now we have um, 
five things that we would like to study. And, and, and I'm just going to show you figures, OK? I'm not going to go into the neuroscience of it, though I think it's, I will try to draw some conclusions. We want to know uh, where in the brain there is an encoding of the block prior, right? Before the, the, before the stimulus even appears, the animal has formed an opinion about what is the most likely place that a stimulus will appear in, right? We would like to know where in the brain there's processing of stimulus. We would like to know where in the brain, before the movement, OK, this is the time of movement, there is processing of choice. Uh, and by choice, we mean whether the animal will turn the wheel left or right. And where in the brain there's processing or encoding of the strength of the movement, how fast will the wheel be moved? And where in the brain there is uh, an encoding of feedback, OK? So there's five things we would like to know. And we had to decide which uh, techniques to use to analyze them. And so we decided that for this initial pass, we would use what is considered the most standard technique. So we focused on four techniques. Um, and I barely have time to tell you what they are. But basically, these are the things you would have found in papers. Um, in most papers, most papers would try to decode the stimulus, for example, or decode an attribute by looking at a population and doing logistic regression. Or you know, maybe newer papers. By the way, th uh, this is work by Ila Fit, who is a member of the IBL and is in this building. Um, uh, we, we would have, for example, a manifold, the trajectory of high dimensional activity um, of all these neurons and see where this uh, diverges, for example, for stimulus left or versus stimulus right, or um, uh, choice left versus choice right. And then we would have uh, single neuron analyses, uh, including linear regression and uh, some, some essentially what used to be called choice probability, but uh, this is a more generic uh, uh, way of doing it, combined condition man-Whitney test. I'm going to breeze through the results because I just want, I want to give you an idea of what the kind of data that we're getting. So this is where we find the biggest problem, which is finding the correlates of the block prior. Here, it seems to really depend on what analysis we use. Okay, so even though now you have 11 theoretical labs working together, looking at the same data, the fact that you know, we divided on purpose, we applied the same group of scientists are using four ways of analyzing the data, we're getting very different answers. If we use this decoding analysis or single cell stats, we come to the conclusion that basically, there, or manifold, that basically there's no place in the brain that is encoding this prior. Okay, but if we use this encoding model here, we come to the conclusion that there's a ton of places in the brain that are encoding the prior. So I don't know if this happens in astronomy. They're all looking at the same, they're all looking at the same images from the telescopes. Um, I don't know if it happens that they have like four different ways to analyze the data, and one of them gives a completely different answer. In fact, we have devoted a whole paper to this encoding of, of prior, but I just want to alert you that I think the victory, the, we can declare victory on uh, I'm citing another Bush president, I don't know why, uh, declaring victory. But anyway, we can declare victory um, on, um, on, on, on all of the problems in that first slide, except on the fact that different analyses um, can, can give totally different answers. And that might be because the question is ill-posed, like looking for ether was an ill-posed question, right? Um, and, um, or it could be because the data is not strong enough. Um, but anyway, and now, now instead, other, th other analyses that gave a much more consistent answer is where are there correlates of stimulus? We essentially found them uh, all over the places that are standard in the visual system, okay? Um, and, and with very few surprises. Again, the encoding seemed to be more enthusiastic about finding correlates. Uh, correlates of choice, widely distributed across the brain. Uh, this did not really surprise us because work in our own lab had already shown that, at least in the mouse brain, you can predict the upcoming choice of an animal by looking at a ton of brain regions, and such as the, the choice left versus right is encoded by a distributed network of few neurons, but in lots of brain regions. And uh, movement speed, uh, uh, there's only two analyses that make sense because this would be only for left for one thing versus the other, and, and speed is a continuous one. Um, encoded all over the brain, consistent with the view that movement in the mouse brain, I don't know if it's true in the primate like, like us, but in the mouse brain, movements are all over the brain. And then finally, feedback. Uh, also encoded everywhere, and it could be a high-level thing like, yay, I got rewarded, or it could be a physical thing about licking. We cannot distinguish the two. So, so this is a summary of the results, and I, I, I've gone through them. I didn't even tell you what the brain regions are. If you were incredibly perceptive, you would have noticed, but, but, but no expectation that you did, that many of these acronyms 
kept on appearing. So some of these regions seem to be implicated in uh, the neural coding of a lot of these things that I showed you. And in fact, in, in this complicated slide we have on the x-axis, we have brain regions. Um, on the y-axis, we have encoding of the various variables. And in here, we have the various analysis. You see that there are some stripes. These are regions that seem to be involved in all of these things. Um, and, but you also see a lot of diversity between the different analyses. So, so, so there, there, there is a win, which is there are some regions that seem to be really uh, winning here, and there's a loss because different analyses are giving us different answers. Okay, so um, this is uh, essentially my summary, this uh, slightly animated uh, graph, and then I think I'm 15 seconds over time. Uh, and so I will stop, but I would have loved to show you these two websites, which I will not show you. Um, uh, but I will share this presentation because you do want to click on them. Um, and so I'm going to just say that the, the summary of the work is stimulus encoded everywhere where you think. Choice all over the brain. Um, wheel speed all over the brain. Of course, some, some neurons in all places. Feedback even more all over the brain. Um, and then this is just the anatomy. And then block is a mystery. In this particular case, I'm showing you just in one place, it's in secondary motor cortex. So there's lots more work to do. I'm gonna stop, I'm over time, and thank you so much. All right, uh, any questions before we go? Yeah, yes, over here. Um, so, so first of all, the, I think one of the questions is, in terms of what we do we do, is, is this specific of a rodent brain where all these signals are so widespread, or, or would it be true in our brains? And I could tell you about a few studies of, in fMRI and EEG that seem to indicate that a human brain would have a lot of these things going on also. But still, uh, there's, a, there's a really important question in knowing whether this applies to primates. And so what do we do depends on the species you're studying. I think if you study mouse, it's just bonkers not to record from the whole brain. Um, you know, to say I'm interested in this region in mouse, it's, it's crazy. And in fact, neuropixels really were a liberation for us because we thought we were interested in some brain region, but on the way to them, we were, even if we didn't want to, recording from lots of other regions. Well, guess what? They tended to have kind of the similar signals. And I'm not saying that everything is everywhere, okay? Vision is in the visual system. Hearing is in the auditory system. Don't get me wrong. But other things such as body movement are represented everywhere. And don't ask me why, because I don't know. I think Tim was... Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So um, we have two recordings per brain region, otherwise they wouldn't appear here, okay? At least two. Um, and, so, and so everything has kind of a replication within it. And so one could ask, what's the variance? And so for, for some, some very small regions, I would, you know, it's possible that we have a huge variance. Uh, if I could, I would have 10 times more data and I could tell you. Um, but yes, I, 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 it's, it's a first pass. Anyway, all of the data are shared, and so one could go back and, 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 and reanalyze and re, remap the, CCF, the Allen CCF onto these data. One more question. Can I just say one more thing? It's so good for starting for having hypotheses. Say, you know, this actually something I didn't say is that there's a ton of interesting signals in cerebellum, okay? I would have never thought. Uh, super interesting. This could be the start of a grant proposal, right? Somebody who studies cerebellum could say, the IBL has found these signals in cerebellum. I don't believe a word of what they're saying. Fund me to go find out. It generates hypotheses. So, you know, when we read like uh, functional MRI studies, like, we always talk about the default mode network. Yeah. It's something that shows up everywhere. Uh, maybe there is actually something that actually shows up everywhere. This is just like, you know, the brain-wide communication. Yeah. Well, I think this is true for some things, but not others. For example, the visual system really is in the visual, vision is in the visual system, okay? You're not gonna find visual cells in S1. 
um, a somat primary somatosensory cortex. Um, and, and, and you know, the auditory system is really in the, in where we think it is. But other signals in the mouse, such as motor signals, are in lots of places. Now, I, I think we don't have an understanding of why that is. Uh, and I do think that in humans there is a lot of activity that I don't know if it needs to be directly mapped onto motor uh, motor mo movements, but th there's there's lots of evidence for activity that is shared. The the resting state networks are much slower than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about work in which, for example, somebody is moving one arm, and you can find activity in the M primary motor cortex that is contralateral, but you find activity all over the brain that influences that too. And I, I could give you citations. Okay, I, I should get out of here. Well, no.